So we're going to be in Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23. This is part 10 in the Mark series covering theology, apologetics, historical insights, and simple contextual verse-by-verse teaching. Um, not forgetting application, of course. I've been saying that at the beginning of each of these, these teachings, but I just want to remind us of what our goal is going through the Gospel of Mark. Each week, we're going to pick up where we've left off in teaching the next passage. The advantage of this is I can't skirt any issues as a teacher. And you don't get the filtered, preferably, you don't get the filtered version of the Bible where I just teach on the passages that I like teaching and ignore others. And so it's verse by verse through the whole text. And a couple things we'll highlight this week, um, and this is what Mark highlights here, are two stories that deal with the Sabbath and Jesus. Um, Mark, in his gospel, he takes these two instances where the Sabbath come up and focuses them in one section in his gospel. Like, he doesn't really talk about the Sabbath after this for many, many chapters. Like, he just doesn't really pay a lot of attention to it in particular. So these two stories are where conflict about the Sabbath is meant to teach us some really important things about God's word and some particulars about the identity of Jesus. That's big in Mark, right? Who Jesus is. I hope we've picked up on that. That's big. And also some major heart issues that we can apply to our lives today in our following of Jesus. Um, I think that's actually a pretty big deal. Also, we'll deal with an apologetic issue, which is the question of whether or not Jesus in this passage in Mark is mistaken about the Old Testament, because that's the accusation. That's the accusation for many skeptics. They'll say, here's a contradiction in the Bible, and it comes right from the lips of Jesus. And I'll say it's not, but I want to walk us through that since it comes up in this passage. All right, that's the intro. Let's dig in. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, Why are they doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. There's a lot here. There's another story we'll get to in a minute, but there's a lot going on here. And uh, I think it's really interesting stuff and exciting stuff. And it's stuff that clears the junk out of our minds if we allow it to. Um, So, here's another controversy, and it's going to be used to teach us about who Jesus is. And the first question I want to ask for us, you know, 21st century readers is, why are they being triggered? Like, what are they tripping on? Like... His disciples are walking around and they pluck grain and they're like eating it. They roll the grain and eat it. And they freak out. What's going on here? Um, Well, it's the Sabbath and the Sabbath for the Jewish person is the day of rest. as, As most people know, the Sabbath is the day of rest. And the Jews were extremely strict about this. And in a sense, I say rightly so. Because God commanded them to rest on that day. It wasn't like an option. It was like, no, you need to rest on that day. That, that, that much is, they're rightly, they're rightly doing and saying, this is a strict thing. We're supposed to rest on this day. It's part of the sign of us being in, in obedience to God and his commands. Um, but how do what they do trigger the breaking of the Sabbath? Like you're breaking the Sabbath, what do they do? Well, it's in verse 1, uh, or excuse me, verse 23. They're passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples began to make their way along while picking heads of grain. They're not, now, they're not harvesting crops, like with sickles and they're gathering in bundles. No, no, no. They're just, they just pick. You guys like this? When I go walks around the block, I, I feel bad for my neighbors because I like subconsciously grab plants. <laughs> do you do this when you guys go walking? And I'm like, I grab plants and I start slowly ripping the leaf into pieces as I continue on my walk. And I'm just thinking about things or praying or listening to something, you know. And uh, so I've tried to change my habit to only picking dead things. So I'm just pruning their gardens now, <laughs> and their trees. Um, so that's me trying to not be a terrible neighbor. But it's a habit. Anyways, they, they pick these things up and they're just nibbling and eating the grain. Luke chapter 6 verse 1 adds a little bit more detail. The same stories in Luke 6. It's actually Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Luke 6, 1, it says that they would they pluck the grains and then they would rub them in their hands. Rub them in their hands. And the idea here is they're eating them. So for us who don't farm, which is modern world, most of us, I think, um, you you grow the grain and the grain has a husk or it has chaff or it has, it's covered by some 
inedible plant material. You pull it off the, the, the stalk, and then you rub it in your hands to get that chaff off, and then now you can eat it. It's like de-seeding a, a pistachio or a, or a um, sunflower seed or something like that. You're just getting the stuff you don't want to eat off. So this is considered by the Pharisees them breaking the Sabbath because you harvested and you threshed. That are like, that was work. You're breaking the Sabbath. You're doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So the question we have then is, did the disciples really break the Sabbath? That's what they're accused of. Did they really break the Sabbath? And I'm going to answer yes and no. Or to be more clear, sort of. <laughs> and I'm going to make the problem a little worse before I make it better by saying this. Jesus also broke the Sabbath and didn't. In the same sense that the disciples did and didn't here. And let me show you in John 5 what I'm talking about. Um, because it depends on what you mean by Sabbath. What do you mean by the term Sabbath? There's a lot of confusion on this, and so I thought it'd be good to like highlight it as we're going through Mark here. In John 5.18, Jesus heals a man, and after healing the man, he tells the man to take up his bed and walk. Take up his bed and walk, which is carrying a burden on the Sabbath that this happens. So he's accused in John 5.18 of breaking the Sabbath, or more clearly, notice what it says about what Jesus did. It doesn't say he was accused, does it? It says he broke the Sabbath. It's just a matter of fact statement. John 5, 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling him, calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So here it says Jesus broke the Sabbath. But then that would be a sin. Violating the law of God as a Jew. So what do we mean, what do we mean he broke the Sabbath? Now, there's one way out of this um, that the Jehovah's Witnesses will always take, uh, in my experience. And that's because John 5.18 is also a deity of Christ passage. Did you notice he made himself equal with God? He called God his own father, making himself equal with God. Well, I'm going to say Jesus really did call God his father. He really did make himself equal with God. And he really did break the Sabbath. But they're going to say, the Jehovah's Witnesses consistently in my experience, will say, oh no, Mike, he didn't really do any of those things. He just, he was thought to have done those things. You know, when you read John 5.18, you should read, For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because they thought that he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. But this is like exactly the opposite of Bible study. I'm literally just adding words into the text and things that aren't in the meaning of the text. But in inevitably, now I'm with the conundrum. If I affirm that Jesus made himself equal with God, I'm also needing to affirm that he broke the Sabbath. And I'm telling you guys... It's okay to say that if you nuance it thoughtfully and don't freak out, which is what a lot of our culture loves. It's just like freak out, no nuance. This is unfortunate. Um, so Jesus sort of broke the Sabbath. And the answer of how he broke the Sabbath in a sense is he healed the cripple, told him to carry his bed and go home. And this was considered carrying a burden in a sense. But it wasn't a burden like going to work. It wasn't a burden like he went to go and work that day. The, he just picks up this mat and carries it home. That's it. Is this, I mean, how much of a burden? If this is a burden, then every woman carrying her purse on the Sabbath is like working on the Sabbath. Especially my wife. Because, I mean, that, I don't know how such a small lady carries such a big purse without having back problems. Um, I'm confused by this. It somehow defies the laws of physics. What did he break? He broke their Sabbath traditions and the additions that they had on top of God's commands of the Sabbath. And that's the same sense in which the disciples broke the Sabbath. Oh, yeah, that was called the Sabbath. They called the Sabbath not just God's command to not labor. They added their traditions into that. And if you broke one of the traditions, they would in common tongues say you broke the Sabbath, even though those traditions weren't God's law. So, for clarity, Jesus broke the Sabbath traditions, but not the commands of God. The disciples broke the Sabbath traditions, but not the commands of God. And Jesus, as we see consistently in the Gospels, he makes a huge difference between the traditions and additions of man versus the clear teaching of the, of the word of God. There's like a big difference between these things. So back to Mark chapter 2 to understand why they're flipping out um, and so upset about this. Um, we, we can, I think as a modern reader, you might read it and think, oh, well, they're upset because they're stealing. They're walking through someone else's field and they're just taking grain. 
taking some grain. But this was actually normal and accepted and appropriate in Israel. In fact, there's actually an Old Testament law about it. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. Look what it says about walking through someone else's grain field and taking grain. It says, when you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. You can pluck it with your hand, but you can't wield a sickle. This is, this is like case law for, for Israel, right? Like, it's okay if you take a little bit to nibble on, but you can't go and harvest their stuff. And so that was just the general thing. In fact, it was considered a kindness to the poor of Israel that the farmers wouldn't fully reap. They would only do one reap, one pass through their, their, their farmland, and they would leave especially the corners and edges, um, you know, on the edges of their property. They would leave that free, unharvested, so that the poor could come and gather what they needed. But... Some other farmer can't come along and just start reaping all that stuff and take it to market. That would be a violation of the principle there. So this is considered okay. But they considered it harvesting or working because there they are, rubbing in their hands, plucking it. Um, yeah, the Sabbath laws of God versus the traditions of man. That's the issue here. Um, we know for sure Jesus was opposed to the additions and traditions that people added to the commands of God. He says this consistently in the Gospels, but in Mark, I'll give an example. Mark 7, verse 8. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He's speaking to the same traditions that they, they use to add to the Sabbath. So Jesus is walking a fine line here that was understood, I think, by the Jews of the time, but is lost sometimes on the 21st century audience. And the application is going to be pretty clear, though. So there's these issues, uh, according to Jesus, where they add to the commands of God, the, tradition, the traditions of people. And I think the Sabbath is, was highlighted by Christ because it was one of the biggest victims of this. The basic command in the Old Testament is don't work on the Sabbath. It also says carry no burden on the Sabbath. It means in relation to working, though, not like, like technically my shoes are a burden, my Long hair is a burden. Like, I mean, you could make it, my glasses are a burden. What, what is not a burden now? In fact, um, it, anyway, I'll, let me explain to you what they did. The, the traditions of the people during Jesus' time added a ton of things to the Sabbath law. And they're now known as like the 39 Sabbath laws. There's like these 39 pro- prohibited behaviors, even in modern traditional Judaism, that um, don't come from the Old Testament, but they come from the tradition and the teaching of the Pharisees, the rabbis that came after them. I got this information from the Orthodox Union, which is a Jewish site, and they list these 39 things and they explain them very briefly because if I went into every detail, it would take days. I'm not kidding. It's like stacks of books just to explain what you can't do on the Sabbath and what you can do and how it can be done. But this is what it says under the category of reaping. It says, you can't reap on the Sabbath And I'll quote now, this includes cutting or plucking any growing thing. So, boom, they've already violated the tradition. Agriculture is, again, one of the main ways in which a man shows his dominance over nature. This category is therefore also one of those mentioned in the Torah, as we find Exodus 34, 21. Six days shall you work, but you shall rest on the seventh. In plowing and in harvesting, you shall rest. So plowing and harvesting, you rest. Well, they considered even one plucking of one head of grain to be in that category. Such activities as plucking a flower and plucking a fruit from a tree come under this heading. You can't pull an orange off a tree and eat it. The same is true of mowing a lawn. You can't mow a lawn on the Sabbath. It is. It was also legislated that we do not handle any growing flowers or plants. You can't even touch them. It is also forbidden to climb a tree or smell a growing flower. Fruit which falls from a tree on the Sabbath may not be used on the same day. You can't be like, it fell on its own, I can get it, you know, or the wind blows. No, man, don't, no, don't touch it. The use of animals as well as plants is forbidden since there is the concern that one might forget and inadvertently pluck a branch for use as a switch. You can see how the Sabbath went from a day of rest to a day of burden under these, under these traditions. So the Sabbath is a glorious thing. We're not coming against that. We're just saying that in the, in the strict enforcement, and, uh, and not just enforcement, but addition of extra commands, that that was a serious problem. Here's what they said under the category of harvesting. I'll just read one brief sentence. That you cannot harvest on the Sabbath. From the same uh, um, Orthodox Union Jewish site, it says, The prime example is threshing grain to remove it from its husk. Squeezing a fruit for its juice is also included. 
So you squeeze a fruit to get the juice out of it, or you, you try to get a grain out of its husk, which is what the disciples did. They, they broke harvesting and threshing, even though no farmer would consider that harvesting. Did you go to work today? Oh, yeah, man. I plucked a handful of grain. I rolled it in my hand, and I stuck it in my mouth. I worked today. Like, nobody thinks this is labor. Like, I didn't go to work to, that day. I carried my mat from the place I was healed to where I went home. Like, I worked that day. Like, no, you didn't. Like, that's not work. That's not what we mean when we say I'm going to work. Maybe some people do. I don't know. It just, it just gets crazy. All the laws regarding the Sabbath, it becomes um, quite extensive. Quite extensive. And I'm not doing this to mock modern Jewish people. It has nothing to do with that. I would say go back to your roots. Go back to the text of Scripture. See what God really said in the Old Covenant, right? See what Jesus fulfilled and how he drew a line between the traditions of man and the word of God. And we need to do the same thing. You need to do the same thing today. But you can't start a fire on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to start a fire, which includes, nowadays, turning a light on. Because you're engaging this electrical connection that's considered like starting a fire. You can't, so you can't start a physical fire. You can't start a fire on your stove. You can't turn a light on. You can't turn your oven on. I don't, I'm assuming you can't use microwaves because it involves kind of those same elements. I wonder how many Jewish people, I'll come to that in a second actually. I wonder how many Jewish people have sat in the dark and cold on a Sabbath day because they just forgot to prepare and turn the lights on before the sun went down and to, you know, get the fire prepared in just the right way so it would be Sabbath approved. And so they sat there in the cold and they were like, well, this is a day of rest. What a blessing. In uh, modern day Israel, if you, if you go into the hotels there, which on our Israel, Israel trips that we've done, you'll see that the elevators themselves, they, they have a special Sabbath like mode that they get into, and these elevators will go up and down, and they'll stop on every floor on the Sabbath. So if it's a 10-story eleva- uh, you know, hotel, it's going to stop on 10 places all the way up, 10 places all the way down. It takes a while to get to where you're going, and a while to wait for the elevator to come to you as well. And you might be catching on the way up, and you just have no control over this because you can't push buttons on the Sabbath to trigger starting a fire. It's, it's violating that thing. Now, I think it's honorable that there's many who are trying to you know, honor God's commands and do what they think. They have a great zeal for God here. I'm saying this is not what the Sabbath is supposed to be about. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. And that's why he highlights the divide between the traditions of man and the commands of God. So this is targeting. He's targeting their traditions, I believe, in this passage. So did they break the law of Moses? No. Did they break the Sabbath traditions of man? Yes. So you could say in a sense they broke the Sabbath. In another sense they didn't. Depends on whether you're talking about the traditions or just the commands of God. But that's only part of the story. Um, Jesus' illustration here, how he talks to them, is a lot more than just saying, hey, you added tradition, that was bad, I'm separating the command of God from tradition. He does a lot more than that. He shows that they have missed something huge in the law, like you wouldn't have added the traditions if you had really understood the law. That's kind of what he gets at. And this kind of gets to our hearts a little bit too when you think about it. Um, So the first thing he says to them is, in verse 25, have you never read Now, slow down for a second. They have totally read and memorized. Like, read, 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 studied, thought about, considered, carefully poured over to say to, like, even a modern, like, serious rabbinical Jew, have you never read? Is like an insult. Have I never read? Have I never read? What are you talking about? But Jesus does this consistently with them because I think he's trying to point out something. And by the way, it's kind of insulting. But in this case, it's just shoving it in their face. Look, you've read, you've read, but you didn't, you didn't understand. And this is what the prophets say about Israel. It's like, here, I've told them, but they didn't get it. I've shared with them, but they haven't heard me. This is, I mean, read Isaiah. Read what, what the Lord said. And then they read it, and it's like, yeah, but maybe, maybe you're doing the same thing your ancestors did with these passages of Scripture. They were convinced they got it, but they didn't. And as application to our lives, I think it's this simple. I need to be open to the correction of Scripture to, to my view being tested and corrected by the clear teaching of the passage and to recognize that though I might hold with zeal to some teaching or some idea, that doesn't mean it's in the Bible. And I just want to notice when I'm two and three steps removed from what the clear teaching of Scripture is on an issue because it's hard to go through that process of letting it go. We tend to assume that whatever church I grew up in, everything that they taught was good. And it it's encouraging to think that and it's nice and it's easy. But then when I read the text of scripture and how easily people get off base, I go, well, 
I want to see it in the text. I want to see it in the text. You know, I want to be right. I want to see it with my own eyes in the text of scripture to guard myself against the traditions of man. That's a good application, I think, for us. Now, this doesn't mean, now there's those who overreact. And they're like, well, if I was taught it when I was growing up, I throw it out until I can prove it. And they often end up recreating a Christianity in their own image, right? Because they're not actually going to scripture to prove it. They're just throwing it out and then just kind of going whatever comes nice to them and natural to them. And it's sort of recreating a Christianity that fits their own, uh, their own image. And so there's a safety in receiving these doctrines and these teachings from our fellowship and from the leaders around us. But there's an authority that God's word has that needs to trump all that stuff. And I think that that is, that is a dividing line in the first century and it's a dividing line for us today as well. We've, we've got to take the authority of scripture. And that's what Jesus points to. So verse 25, let's get into where he kind of is a little rude, some might think, but rightly so. Um, and we'll explain why when we get to the Son of Man phrase, and you'll see why it's totally his place to do this. And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Now, this is a really puzzling Old Testament passage, Old Testament story. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And the question and the challenge is like, how did Jesus mean? Like, what was the application when he brought this up? David, in this passage, is fleeing from his life, for his life, from Saul, who has just been exposed as, yes, he is really trying to kill David. David's the anointed of God. He's the called of God. And he's the one who's going to be the next king of Israel. Saul is not on board with this. You can understand why because <laughs> he's the current king of Israel and he's been rejected by God. And so he becomes jealous and paranoid and selfish. And this is the whole thing happened with David and Jonathan in the prior chapter. Well, now he's fleeing. And where does he go? He flees for his life to a city called Nob. Nob is where the tabernacle is at this time, it seems. And this is where he meets a guy named Ahimelech, who was one of the priests, one of many priests, like 80 something priests that were there at that location. And he asks for food, but there is no food. Now, this might have been because it was on the Sabbath. He may have showed up on the Sabbath. We're not sure. It's just a guess. Some people think he did. But he shows up and he's like, I need food. Do you have any food? And Ahimelech's like, well, the only food we've got is the food in the tabernacle, or it's from the tabernacle. It's these 12 loaves of bread called the bread of the presence. These, these went on the golden, uh, the golden table that was in the, the holy place, not the holy of holies, right? But that first room that the priests could enter on a regular basis, not the once a year area. And there it was. And each Sabbath, they would take the old bread out and then the priest could eat it. And they'd, they'd make hot bread and put it back in there for the new day. So then the, the bread that he has is this bread and only the priests are allowed to eat it. But David, he says, we're starving. We desperately need this food. And so Ahimelech gives him the bread. David eats it. He also gets the sword of Goliath that happened to, been, happened to have been stored in the same location. And then he goes off on his merry way. So there may be a parallel here, like what's Jesus doing? What's he doing with this story? And the parallel could be that David and his companions are being compared to Jesus and his companions. David and his companions being compared to Jesus and his companions. This is possible, one impossible interpretation. Maybe the idea is that if David could violate a clear rule that God gave in order to save lives, then Jesus' disciples could violate the man-made rules of tradition to better serve Jesus. This is one interpretation. I don't know if I'm super comfortable with it, but it's one that's been put forth. Many rabbis actually agree with this. This is not an, an, an un-Jewish idea. Many rabbis, modern rabbis, will be like, oh yeah, this is common knowledge. Like if you have like a Sabbath, you know, service and someone falls down and they're dying right there and you're doing CPR for an hour to try to keep them alive, that's, I mean, that would be work. You ever done CPR? 10 seconds of that thing is like a lot of work, just so you know. You do try to do CPR. It's I'm only a dummy. I've never done it real life on someone or I wouldn't be smiling about it because that's pretty horrendous stuff. But, but if you were doing this CPR on someone for like an hour, you know, you're like, yeah, that was work. You're, you're, you're sweating. Your muscles are all destroyed and you need to sleep for a week. It's pretty much the only possible solution. But that would be labor. But they would say, no, that's appropriate. It's a Sabbath, but it's to save a life. It's an immediate present need to save a life. So they would say, yeah, yeah, I know what David did was okay because we understand the heart. And this is maybe a better interpretation. We understand the heart of the law. We understand that while these rules were given, yet there are times where human need will take precedence over those rules. That's a possible interpretation. Here's another um, 
rep- way to represent that interpretation is David's situation reveals the heart of the law, that human life takes priority over the rituals that are going on in the law. And the leaders in Jesus's time were valuing their rules over the well-being of other people. This could be a, a looser parallel because Jesus's disciples aren't going to die if they don't pluck these heads, right? But it could be a looser parallel. In which case, Jesus is then rebuking their traditions and he's saying, in effect, you don't understand what the Sabbath is ultimately about. Which comes to his statement after he gives this story where he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You don't understand what this is really about. And I think there's a hermeneutical principle we can gather here as we study the scripture. We have the Sabbath taught about. We have the laws about the tabernacle taught about. But then we also have examples of how that played out in Israel's history. And we should look at the teaching passages, the didactic, the teaching passages of scripture, but also the examples of how they play out in real life. Because both of these are um, inspired by the Holy Spirit to be recorded for us. And so the same thing for us, we look at the New Testament clear teachings about um, what the gospel is, but it's good to also look at how it was presented in the book of Acts to different people and to learn from those examples. Of course, we have to separate good examples from bad examples as well. Um, anyhow, it is it is a bit of a puzzle. I have to admit, it's a puzzle. Like, what exactly is Jesus getting at with this parallel between him and David or the servants of David and his servants, that idea? I think the one thing we can safely say is it seems to be about the heart of the meaning of the law as it's compared to the needs of people. And that is something they misunderstood. And let's explain that a little bit, a little bit more here, hopefully. So in verse 27 of Mark 2, Jesus concludes this illustration with the phrase, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is like a principle which people debate on this. It's interesting reading commentaries on these passages. Sometimes commentaries betray some pretty sketchy views on the authority of scripture and things like that. And these are unfortunately some of the commentaries that come with the software that I have. Because <laughs> I can't afford a thousand commentaries. But um, this this principle that the, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, I think probably the best way to support it with the Old Testament is Exodus 16 verse 29. This might be the best way to support it. The reason why I want to support it is because some would say, Jesus is just straight overturning the Old Testament here. He's just overruling it. But this is not the case. This is never the case. Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken, right? We, he will clarify and he will restore the meaning of scripture. He's not here to overrule it, no matter what progressive Christianity wants to tell you about their version of Jesus. Exodus 16, 29 says, See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. He's given you the Sabbath. It's a gift. He's given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. This is speaking of the manna. It would fall enough for two days on the day before the Sabbath. Remaining, remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. The idea is it's a gift. You can rest. I'll provide for you enough that you can just take it easy and I'll take care of you. That's the idea. Now, there's an idea of also of God's command. So when you violate the Sabbath, you're violating God's you know, direct commanded will. And so there's a rebelliousness that needs to be dealt with there. So this was about, if I can summarize kind of some of the main points that I've come across so far. Jesus was rebuking their traditions, I think, clearly just letting his disciples do what was not in violation of the tradition, but he didn't care about their traditions. In fact, it seems as though he had an uh, had animosity. I was going to say anim- animosistic attitude. That's not a word. So he had animosity towards those traditions, and he wanted to violate them, and he wanted to put them on blast, so to speak, to, to show that this is not part of God's will. Let's separate your man-made religion from the clear teaching of God's word. But that's not the whole story because it was also about them missing the heart of the command. See, they added these traditions because they missed the heart of the message. And that's where he gets into this. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I think that many times we can add our own traditions and additions. And by doing so, we're revealing that we have also missed the heart of God's commands. And this is where Christianity, dare I say this, because I, I hate to sound like, like a liberal here, but <laughs> like a liberal theology person, but, but this is where we, we tend to add a bunch of rules that aren't necessarily clearly in scripture about things that we think are preserving holiness and preserving godliness, but in some ways they're focusing on the outside of the cup because we've forgotten about the inside. 
and that can be the case. That can be the case. And it, I think that, um, for instance, uh, I think that, in my opinion, Catholicism does this when it adds the priesthood to uh, Christianity. It has this whole system of priesthood, and these mediators between you and God, who you go to to have better access to God. And I think that that misses a heart issue, is that Jesus is the one mediator between God and man, and that I have full access directly to God through Christ. And I think that the addition of these mediators is because it's missing the heart of our access to God through Christ, or the addition of works because it's missing the heart of the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. I think that this is a heart issue. So there's parallels today as well. It's kind of like in, uh, in cooking shows, um, the rebuke they're getting, you guys like, I like watching cooking shows. I don't, my food doesn't look like that, probably doesn't taste like that, but I like looking at the shows. And one, one of the things is they're judging the things they've cooked. One of the worst things they can say to you is, you forgot salt. And I've seen the shows where they get like put on blast here for, for forgetting salt. They're like, you did all this stuff, but you forgot salt. Did you even taste the food? No, I was in so much of a hurry, I didn't even taste it. And the chef who's judging the show looks at him and they're like, what is wrong with you? Like, this is like cooking 101. You taste your ingredients, you taste your product as you're going, you add salt. You, everyone adds salt, you always add salt. It's, it's a necessary thing. And so our doctrine can be like this, where we have it all put together, and, but we're missing the salt of God's grace, of God's love. We're missing the basic things. We're forgetting love and mercy and kindness. And this is what he accuses them of. He goes, oh yeah, you, you know, you're doing these things and that's, that's great, but you've neglected the weightier matters. Mercy. It's a weightier matter to Jesus, you know, and that's the idea. They had a uh, missing things, missing elements. They had the outside clean, but the inside dirty as a result. So we have to apply this to our lives. The mercy of Christ, the grace of God, the love of God must be at the center of all my theology, I think. It really, it really should. So here Jesus is speaking, it seems, about these big sweeping truths about Christianity because he's highlighting major errors in their thinking. He's using an example of the Sabbath issue to target a big, huge issue in their thinking. And that's why we see his answer, he answers a lot more than they asked. Why are your disciples doing this? And he answers all this stuff. In this case, it's a confusion about the nature of the Sabbath. He says it's made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And if they'd understood this, they wouldn't have turned the day of rest into a burden. Remember that one of the commands is, you shall carry no burden. But the Sabbath laws became so extensive that carrying them was a burden. And they turned what was meant to be a freedom thing. And, a, and a, still an obedience thing. You had to obey the Sabbath. Yeah, but they turned it into a burden. Which is interesting. He tells them also that they uh, tie heavy burdens and put them on men's shoulders. Think of the irony of that. Because the Sabbath ended up being tying of heavy burdens and putting them on men's shoulders. Now, there might be a, a typology thing here going on as well. Because Jesus comes to them, and they've taken a day of rest, and they turn it into a day of work. And he's rebuking that and restoring the idea of rest to the Sabbath, at least for those who will listen to him and follow him. Yet also, in typology, Jesus is, is, brings us into God's rest. Right? He saves us apart from our works, and he brings us that knowledge of the grace of God and we rest in his finished work for us on the cross. Jesus gives us rest from works and yet some people want to add to that, don't they? They want to add their works. Um, and it's not just religious legalists who want to do this. It is the most common you know, American understanding of the gospel of Christ. Is that you're going to go get to heaven. Why? Because you're a good person. But what about Jesus? Oh yeah, no, him too. Him too. But I'm going to die and I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. They're adding their works. Yet the scripture says our righteousness is as filthy, filthy rags. In a sense here, modern people who often will call religious people who are living strict lives for Jesus. They'll call them, what, are they, what word do they like to use for them? Pharisees, legalists, or hypocrites. Even if they're consistently living it out, they're automatically hypocrites just because they seem like they have strict lives. <laughs> For Jesus. Um, but in reality, the Pharisees were adding man's traditions, man-made religion, and they were adding their righteousness to try to, to please and appease God. And modern culture says, I don't need to strictly hold to the teachings of God's word. I'm going to kind of do my own thing. I'm going to add a little bit of like, I don't know, 
We'll add some Oprah Winfrey teaching in here. I'll get some vibration stuff going on over here. You know, I've got some law of attraction going on over here. I got all this nice stuff. And what about when you die and face the Lord? Oh, I'm a good person because I got my good works. You'll be like, you're just like a really loosey-goosey Pharisee. Right? You still think you're righteous. They just had way higher standards than you. That's all. <laughs> That's the difference. Um, so, moving forward. Um, then we get to this beautiful phrase in verse 28 where it says, So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And this is, this is about the identity of Christ. Something about Jesus and who he is. <clears throat> we saw a couple studies ago that Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man. In Mark, in particular, prim- primarily, not only is it his primary self-title throughout the Gospels, he uses it of, his, of himself more than anything else. He calls himself Son of Man. But he uses it particularly to reveal things about his identity. And we saw this by doing a survey of all the Son of Man, or a bunch of the Son of Man passages in Mark. But what does it mean in this case when he says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath? The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What does it mean? Well, I think it means two different things. So the first one is this, and it's easy to see it. Who is the one who is in charge of the Sabbath? Who ordered it and ordained it and instructed others to obey it? God. I mean, who's Lord of the Sabbath? Well, God's Lord of the Sabbath. That's what he is. In fact, in Jesus' time, they had um, you know, copies of the, New Te- of the Old Testament written in Greek, and they didn't transfer the divine name, you know, Yahweh, they didn't transfer that over to the Greek copies. They would use a different word in its place. And they all knew that the divine name was there, but they'd use a different word so that when they read it out loud, they weren't saying the name because they, that was something they would, that was a tradition, but something they wouldn't do. Don't say the name. You might say it in vain. Don't say it. And so they would use a word kurios, which is translated as the word Lord. And so he calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. And yet they're, they're used to, in their reading, to knowing that, you know, frequently Yahweh is Lord. Lord means Yahweh. And so it's very interesting that he says this. It's heavy with meaning. Another way to put it is this. Who else in the Bible would claim to be Lord of the Sabbath? Do you think, do you think David would claim to be Lord of the Sabbath? Are you kidding? I'm David. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. No, of course he wouldn't say something like that. Would Isaiah? I'm Isaiah, the prophet. You know, Lord of the Sabbath. Like, no, he would never claim to be Lord of the Sabbath. Who else would claim this? Would Moses claim to be Lord of the Sabbath? No, he just received it like the rest of them. He didn't... He was the one who told him about it, but he wouldn't have claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath. Peter. Would Peter be like, I'm Lord of the Sabbath? Not, not later in Jesus' ministry, he wouldn't. Maybe early. No, I'm just kidding. Don't be so mean to Peter, right? Uh, no, of course he wouldn't say something like that. It would be considered blasphemous. Jesus says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Because he's God with us. Because he's Lord of the Sabbath. That's, that's the thing. And I love how he says it. Notice in the text, he doesn't just say, I'm the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He says, the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Just so you know, my Lordship goes beyond the Sabbath. But it does include the Sabbath. It's like, it's one of my domains. You know, like, I've got, I've got, I'm in charge of this, but so much more. So this is a huge, bold claim by Jesus. Yet it's careful, because if he claim, came out and claimed, I am God, it would cause potentially two problems. One, he would be immediately killed. Um, before the time. He wanted it to happen at the right time. But second, that title was generally used in the early church more often than not for the Father. And Jesus is being careful to reveal his deity, but not to confuse who he is with the Father, right? Because we don't have a modalism thing going on here. We don't have God, the Father, becoming the Son who becomes the Holy Spirit. So there needs to be a differentiation. He's, He's God, but he's not the Father. He's deity, but he is not the Father. And so here we have this careful, nuanced thing, while at the same time making it harder to prosecute him for the claims because he's saying it in a slightly roundabout way. So the second thing that it means, I think, Lord of the Sabbath, is the most obvious plain meaning on the face of it is, you think you're in charge of the Sabbath? I am. Like, that's what he's saying to them, because here's the question they come up. Notice notice what the leader said. Matthew, um, oh wait, no, hold on. Let me read first Matthew 23, 4 to set the context for this. I got confused by my notes. See, it happens to me too. Um, As opposed to just confusing you with my notes. That's different. Uh, Matthew 23, 4 says, They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with uh, with so much as a finger. This is what the leaders were doing. They had taken it on themselves to be the, the guarders, the protectors of the word of God, and they would protect it. And this is actually an illustration that comes from the rabbis. 
by, by drawing a hedge around the Bible. So all these extra laws and extra commands, it's like drawing a hedge around the, the commands of God. So we're going to make it really, really sure that you don't accidentally stumble and break one of the commands by making sure that you don't get anywhere near it by adding tons of extra stuff. So these are the heavy burdens. They consider themselves to be the guardians of the Sabbath. This is why when they approach him in Mark 2.24, they say, the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? Because in a sense, it's like, who do you think you are? These guys walk up to Jesus and his disciples and they're just like studying them to see when they do something wrong. And they know it's the Sabbath and they know all the extra Sabbath laws and these are just peasants. You know, these are just the uneducated fishermen from Galilee. Of course, they're going to mess something up. They don't have all the careful hundreds of extra additions we've got. So they watch him and then they see him do that and they go, Jesus, why do your, why do your disciples do this? They think they're the guards of the Sabbath. So in, in short, Jesus is saying, yo, that's in the Greek, the original Greek. He's saying, yo, I'm the son of man. You don't tell me about the Sabbath. I tell you about the Sabbath. Why are they taking these heads of grain? You don't even understand the Sabbath. Let me tell you a story that's going to make you go, wait, what? Yeah, you know that thing in, about David and the whole taking of the, yeah, puzzle on that for a while. Guess what? The Sabbath wasn't made for man. Uh, it was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And by the way, I am the one who's in charge of it. This is what he's claiming. No wonder why they conclude by trying to kill him. As we'll see in a minute, they're like starting to plot against him. Uh, we'll see in a moment. But before we move on to the second uh, passage in Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, I want to deal with the apologetic issue that I mentioned. So we'll deal with the second Sabbath story. It's a very different tact or direction we'll take on that one. But the apologetic issue is this. In Mark 2.26, Jesus says it was, it was um, in the time of Abiathar the high priest that David entered and ate the bread, right? In the time of Abiathar the high priest. But when you go to the passage in the Old Testament for Samuel 21 where this takes place, it's Ahimelech, not Abiathar, that seems to be functioning as high priest. I say seems because the phrase high priest isn't used anywhere in the passage. They're just called priests. They're all called priests. But Ahimelech is the father of Abiathar. It seems as though he would be functioning as the high priest. It's possible that Jesus has inside knowledge. And maybe really Abiathar was functioning as the high priest. And Ahimelech was not. And he was functioning as a priest. That's possible. But the, 1 Samuel 21 doesn't make this clear. This would be Jesus' divine knowledge if that was the case. So we're, I don't want to assume too much here. So the question is, um, is, is Jesus wrong? Now, this, is, this is where the skeptics will come in. Say, well, Jesus was wrong. Or Mark was wrong. Or his source was wrong but this is just wrong, right? It, it was, it was Ahimelech, not Abiathar. Um, others add to, add to the problem and they say, plus Matthew and Luke don't include this passage. They have the, pa the story of the Sabbath altercation, but they don't include the phrase in the time of Abiathar. They don't have that sentence in there. Now, this is, this is interesting conjecture. When you get to people who are comparing the Gospels, you got to be ready for this. They'll say, oh, well, Matthew and Mark don't, they don't record the same thing. I'll tell you, I think Matthew was trying to hide Mark's mistakes. And here you just got to go, like, you're trying to read the mind of the author. This is not a good idea, especially when you have an agenda to undermine the text of Scripture. You're going to find what you want. It's called confirmation bias. That's what's going to happen. So an interesting response to that is this. It was normal, as you read consistently through Mark and Luke, it is normal for them to leave out details like time and place references. That's normal. When something's recorded in Mark and it has time and place references, it's normal for them to just not even re refer to those things in the other Gospels. So it's just consistent. It's not like they specially picked one thing to leave out. It just seems like their normal behavior, their routine. So reading into it is unwise at that point. It's unjustified. Uh, but there's uh, several answers that have been put forth, like several, like probably a dozen possible solutions to this this problem of Ahimelech and Abiathar. And the one that I, I lean towards has to do with the, the Greek word that's used here. It's epi. The phrase in the time of is, is translated, translating just one Greek word, epi. Epi is a preposition that has uh, meanings like upon, um, before, and it, it's like prepositions like we use in our language today. It has a lot of variety of uses in these words. Um, it's, it's used potentially, and in other places, it's used to mean not when, as in when Abiathar was high priest, but in the time of, which is actually how it's translated here in the NASB. In the time of Abiathar, the high priest, it's the time of Abiathar, who may or may not have been high priest at that time, 
But to differentiate this Abiathar from some other Abiathar, you say in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, he was the high priest at some point, and he was alive when this event took place. In fact, he was there. Ahimelech was there, but so was Abiathar. He was there. He, he later will find out more story, more information I'll share in a minute. Um, we get this kind of usage potentially in Luke 3.2 and in Acts 11.28, where there's a similar in the time of, and it seems to be referring to, in fact, Luke 3.2 seems to be referring to uh, in the time of, and it mentions Caiaphas and Annas, two different high priests, and it talks about when John the Baptist showed up on the scene in the time of Annas and Caiaphas. This might be a similar reference where it's referring to the time period of their lives. It's, the, it's a general time period. Sometimes we're asking for too much exacting detail and specificity. What time did you get there? Two o'clock? Well, I found out it was 2.03. You were wrong. Like sometimes we're not being given as many details or exacting of details as we want. But I think there's more information here. Because the question I have next as, as a Bible student is, well, why then would Jesus highlight Abiathar, not Ahimelech? If Ahimelech's the guy David talks to and the guy that gives him the bread, why does Jesus highlight Abiathar? What's the reason for this? And I think there's a few good answers to this question. One is, Abiathar was more well-known and more notable than Ahimelech. He appears this one time. He pretty much doesn't appear later. Abiathar went on to become David's high priest, David's priest, and the one who consulted with David and helped David out. So this is a turning point where the son of Saul, just Jonathan, just gave his allegiance to David. And now the priesthood is giving their allegiance to David, resulting in Abiathar becoming David's priest. And so the kingdom's being handed to David piece by piece um, over the protestations of Saul. In fact, there's more information here, which is this. Abiathar didn't just become high priest in some later date. He, came, he became high priest as a result of David eating this bread. Let me explain. David eats the bread. Saul finds out about it. He comes to the town. And because he's so jealous, he kills every priest he can find that is in the whole town. He slaughters them. One escapes. Can you guess his name? Abiathar. So he was there and he escapes and he flees to who? To David. And he becomes his priest. And this is where his priestly duties of, of doing the kind of high priest stuff, with, you know, takes place as you read through the story. So the, let, me, let me draw maybe a parallel here. Um, the leadership knew David was anointed, but rejected and persecuted him. And this results in the loss of their priests and the loss of, the loss of God's um, blessings upon them through those priests. A new high priest comes and that high priest goes to serve David, the true anointed of God. And I say this is because the whole Old Testament is about Jesus. And I think Jesus is highlighting this. I think this is meant to draw attention to Abiathar. David is the anointed. He represents Christ. And um, Saul and those who fight against it represent the leadership who's fighting against Jesus. And here you are fighting against Jesus. And just like Saul, you're going to lose it all. And it's going to come to me. I think Jesus is almost drawing a parable parabolic type illustration through this sort of thing. God's anointed is going to win and they will lose out on everything. So this is based on the idea that Jesus, if you want to take my interpretation here, it's based on one idea. Jesus, rather than being a clumsy and uninformed about the Old Testament, he has a very thoughtful and nuanced understanding of the Old Testament. That's where your interpretation here will shift. Do you think he doesn't know or do you think he knows and he knows what he's doing? And then you're going to get your interpretation, your view on that. I think he does have a thoughtful and nuanced view. And you could build a case for this. I mean, just look at what Jesus says all the time. Look at what he just did with this whole story about, about David. Look what he does when he, when he, when he quotes uh, Psalm, is it Psalm 110, where he says, if, if, uh, uh, Why does David say, my Lord's, the Lord said to my Lord? Like, who's his, who's his Lord? If, if the Messiah is his son, who's his Lord? What's, what's going on here? And it's just like this careful, nuanced, like thoughtful use of the Old Testament. And that's what Jesus is doing here. But let me add one more thing. This is an apologetic issue that has caused some people a lot of pain and a lot of, uh, really, like, leave the faith because of this issue. This Abiathar Ahimelech issue. And all I want to say is this. Even if you felt like my answer doesn't count, well, there's other ones. You could look up other possible solutions on your own. But it's not proper to abandon your faith because you're like, Abiathar or Ahimelech? I'm not a Christian. Do you see how this is like an overreaction? This is like an overreaction. Like, oh, 
Sorry, kids, we're not going to Disneyland today. We're going next week. I want to die. Like, that's a slight overreaction. Don't you think? Like, this is... We need to not have that kind of fragile faith that's hanging in the balance. It's just, if I can't answer every question totally convincingly, all my faith will die. Well, that's not even faith. Because what I, what I, when I have faith, what I'm saying is, I have good reasons to believe. This doesn't mean I can answer every single question posed to me by anybody who asks it. I don't, there's questions I don't know the answers to. I'm sorry, I don't know microbiology that well to answer every question you have about it. Just talk about how DNA is formed. Okay, I'm interested in this. I've looked into it some, but, but I won't be able to answer every possible question about it. I remember hearing about the RNA world hypothesis and thinking like, oh, this is interesting stuff, but I don't feel like I have to defeat it the first time I hear about it as a Christian or my faith will fall. Plus, I think it would just be more evidence for God even if it was true, so, <laughs> in my opinion. But, um, but yeah, we need to have a solid faith that's not so fragile as to fall apart when we have one question we can't answer. That's that's just a psychologically bad place to be in, I think, and we shouldn't be there. Um, anyhow, <clears throat> I do think it's easy. It's relatively easy to answer that question. So chapter 3, let's look at the next passage. We'll move quicker this time. Uh, but chapter 3, verse 1, is related to the Sabbath. I'd like to get it done today. So it says, He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. Was withered. He had some sort of medical issue. His hand's withered. It seems like it's emaciated and able to use it. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Let that sink in. So they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. So here's the trap. It's the Sabbath. There's this guy with the withered hand. Let's make sure that you know Jesus can see him from where he is. And let's see if he heals him. And then we'll have him. Are you insane? Let's see if he heals him. And then we'll then you'll know he's the Messiah, is the is the answer to this riddle, right? Like then you'll know he's the true son of God. But no, you're like, no, then we'll have him. He will have violated our Sabbath rules. Like, what kind of darkness is in your mind when you can be in this place? What caused this? What was wrong with the Pharisees? And some would answer, in our culture especially, well, they were religious. That's what was wrong with them. They were religious extremists. I mean, Jesus is like the most extreme religious extremist you've ever seen. The problem is that they were extreme about the wrong things, right? But there's nothing wrong with being a religious extremist. I want to be as extreme as I possibly can following Jesus. Um, Absolutely. We, We use the word extremist like it's synonymous with terrorism. And that's obviously not the case because not every religious view has you committing acts of terrorism. So it's, what if you're extremely peaceful and loving and kind and gracious and self-giving and you extremely want to live to honor God and glorify him and serve your fellow man? Like, I don't really see a problem with this kind of extremism. Um, so yeah, it wasn't that they were ex- extremists. It was this. Two things. They were self-righteous and they had man-made religion. These, th- these are the things that I think identify a Pharisee for what they are. As I spoke about a minute ago, but I want to drive it home a little bit more. They were self-righteous. They rejected the baptism of John, which would be admitting that they were sinners. I'm not going in that water. I have to repent to do that. I'm not admitting I'm a, I'm a sinner. Why would I need to repent? As I heard not long ago, the president of our country say, why would I have to repent? I just don't do things that are wrong. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately, I think he's encountered some uh, unbiblical leadership, Christ- Christian leadership in his life, and this has led him down some very strange doctrinal paths, but that's self-righteousness. They also reject Jesus's authority. Um, But you might ask, how could they think themselves righteous after looking at the Old Testament? I mean, the law, they fall short so much of the law. How could they think they're righteous? And then we have the examples in in the scripture of Israel failing over and over again. Israel, they kill the prophets. They they reject God. God calls them Sodom. He's like, "I, I drove them out and put you in the land. You're worse than them. The, the application is that God, throughout the Old Testament, and by the way, when you see horrible behavior by humans in the Old Testament, it's to show you horrible behavior by humans because you're a human and you need to know that you're a sinner, right? I, I want to draw out the reality of my sinful condition so that I will know I need God, but they didn't see it this way and that's where we get to man-made religion. They, they were self-righteous because of their man-made religion. Man-made religion usually does make you feel self-righteous. It makes you feel like you're a good person. 
Religion here is not the enemy. Man-made religion is. There's one true religion. I want that. I want God's views, God's teachings, beliefs about God and how to follow him. And you want to, I don't know how we get away from calling that religion. That is religion, but it's true. That's the thing. It's true religion. It's, it's authentic. So religion is not the enemy. Man-made religion is. And it's ironic when people come against religion in general, we hear this all the time, right? Well, I'm just opposed to religion. I know one church uh, that's grown a lot, they become a very big church, and they say, we're a church for people who hate religion. And I'll be like, do you really don't think you're religious? <laughs> you're a what? We're a church. And you gather like on a regular basis, you guys worship together, you have teaching, you have theology, you have practices and how to follow God in your lives. Well, yeah, we got all that stuff, but we're not a religion. Have you looked in the mirror? Like, that's religion. That's what religion is. The question is, is it true or not? And those who just come against religion in general, they're just like that church. They just make their own religion. I'm spiritual. I'm just not religious. Oh, well, what do you think about God? Oh, well, I think this, this, this about God. What do you think about what happens to us when we die? I think this, this, this happens to us when we die. What do you think about, like, uh, when, you know, people go to heaven. Do they go to heaven, hell? What's, what's afterlife? What's that about? What about ultimate meaning and value? Oh, I got all these opinions. Dude, that's religion. You're religious. You just say, I'm not really, everyone else is religious, but I'm not. What I have is just superpowers of spirituality. Like, I don't know what that means, except that it's some sort of arrogant way to judge everyone else without looking in the mirror. And that's the nature of man-made religion. It makes me self-righteous. So when I reject all religion, I just end up embracing my own religion without being aware of it is kind of the end result. Um, and just start asking people questions about the afterlife and God and heaven or hell. And you'll just find out, yeah, they've got a religion. But they maybe just made it up as they went along, which has got to be a warning sign, right? Like, I don't know about people who study the Bible, but, but I kind of feel like I know the truth about God and everything by just kind of what sort of feels right. Like, try this with working on your car, you know, or programming your computer or something. I mean, just like do whatever sort of feels right in the moment, whatever seems like it'll work for you. And Anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll see. <laughs> um, Notice this too. Jesus, he didn't reject religion in general because he doesn't say to them, who cares what you read? He says, have you not read? So he's acting like the Old Testament would have fixed the problems if they had just paid attention to it. He, the, the scriptures of the Old Testament, Jesus is not rejecting. He's not, he's not casting them off. No, no, they're treasured and, and precious to him. And he's bothered that they've added to these things. And so we don't add to the scripture. So he targets their errors and he purifies by taking their traditions away from the scripture, so to speak. A proper understanding of the Old Testament leads you to Jesus and your need for him. It's really important that we see this. So where today do we see self-righteousness and man-made religion? Everywhere. 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 From the people who are too good to go to church on Sunday. Because all those people are judgy. Someone told me recently, a family member, and they were like, I went to a church over there, but they were all like judging me and they were all self-righteous. And I said, all of them? I said, yeah. And so I just came out and said it. And I said, do you think maybe you were judgy and self-righteous? Because you just determined that all these people you don't know are judgy and self-righteous by looking at them? Either you have superpowers of discernment or you're mean. <laughs> you know, I don't know what else to call it. Well, I, one person didn't smile at me the right way, or maybe they smiled too much. They're fake. That person smiled way too much. They're fake. You know, okay. That's ama you're amazing. You're able to read people's hearts and minds so quickly. It's quite a skill. But we see this all over the place. So-called progressive Christianity, that's the term for it, progressive Christianity, which often means just throwing away anything you don't like about Christianity and replacing it with whatever culture likes. Um, we see self-righteousness there because their main target is to vilify whatever Christianity they've cast off. Their main target is that. Um, casual cultural Christianity is also self-righteous and man-made. It's not about bowing my life to the authority of God, to the word of God, to the person of Christ. It's about doing what I want and nodding my head in some sense a little bit to the Lord. And then I'm, I should be good, right? Because I'm a good person. Then there's like the Frankenstein religious views of our culture where we have these conflicting views and you ask people about their religious views and you find that they don't even agree with themselves within their own views because it's just they're that much in darkness on these issues, which is why we want to have these conversations, right? Ask them about them. What do you, what do you think about this? How about that? And you, and you draw out of them their thoughts. 
but it usually comes down to be a good person, make your own path. Um, most people, in my experience, who call other people Pharisees think that they're good people, right? And those other people are messed up and they have their man-made religions, their own views, and those people are the Pharisees and they're self-righteous. But it's so often it seems like it's either both people are or they are. And um, this is why we need Jesus, man. We're all sinful people who desperately need the grace of God through Jesus Christ. So they laid the trap. They want to see if Jesus heals him. This is like our culture, like they're waiting for an offense. Wait, I don't need to hear what you're saying. I just need to hear certain words. And then triggered, you know, and then boom, all of a sudden, like, now you better tweet out an apology or we're going to come after you like crazy, like all this stuff. I mean, this is like our culture. They're looking for an offense. And sadly, Christian truth is becoming dangerously offensive in our culture. People are losing their jobs. People are getting um, lawsuits and various other problems sidelined in their careers because of things like this. But notice this. Jesus didn't stop. He knew this was going to cause controversy. He knew the end result is they're going to try and kill him. But he does it anyways. He tells the man, come up here, come forward, and puts him in front of everybody to make an example out of the very thing that would trigger them the most. This is not culturally sensitive. But he's very sensitive to the needs of the culture. Not the morals and the views of the culture, but the needs of the culture. So he does needful ministry. He targets cultural issues many times. We, we could take this example from Jesus. So get up, come forward. He makes an example of it. He goes headfirst into the most controversial issues of his day, whether it was talking about marriage or talking about the traditions and the Pharisees and stuff. Um, he just goes headfirst into these kinds of issues. And I think as Christians today, we should not see cultural issues as things we're afraid of. We should see them as things our culture needs help with. And we go headfirst into those issues to help those people. It's, a, it's evangelistic. It's meant to minister to people. But too many pulpits have been silent for too long, and so congregations are confused. And they're, and they're irritated at their own leaders. They get asked a question about, you, you name it, like homosexuality, and their leader dances around for five minutes on stage, apologizes for how the church has treated the LGBT community, and then moves on. And you're like, okay, but that's all? Like, I don't even know what to think about this issue anymore. But I know one thing. You're not in trouble. <laughs> like, that's all I know. Like, you're not in trouble. And um, Jesus, he gets, in, he gets himself in trouble. Not, not to offend people, but to preach the kingdom. It does offend people. Then the response in uh, verse 4 is silence. He says, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? He goes right to the heart of their confusion. He's like, you like don't even care about people anymore. You just want to trap people in your little, with, play your little games and to have your little trigger offense. Um, you've, you're, Jesus, you're not woke enough for us. And so... He gets right to the heart of the issue. They missed mercy, compassion, and love. And again, Jesus, he's not violating the Sabbath. He's exposing their twisted version of it for what it is. They're so hardened because they have the ability to ignore God's truth when it stares them in the face. Instead, they find it offensive. They don't see him as the Messiah. They see him as a target. Right? We've got to take him down. And also, they've lost love. They've lost love. And we live in a time like this where there's hard hearts and there's a loss of love. And I, you could feel it in our culture. The anger is rising. The anger is rising. Right? The, it, it's just, it's growing in intensity. And Jesus still goes head first into it. And I think as Christians, we have to do so, not for any political reasons, but to represent Christ and the truth of God, whether our culture accepts or rejects it. And the early church is our example of this as they suffered even martyrdom for the sake of preaching simply the truth of Christ, no matter how offensive it was when they wouldn't pinch, take their pinch of incense to Caesar. And then in verse 5, we see Jesus' response. After looking at them, around them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. So Jesus is two things. He's angry, and he's grieved. And I think that this is a really interesting balance. He's actually angry, and that was totally fine. Anger is not necessarily a sin, certainly not in this case. Sometimes it results in sin. Even right anger can result in wrong actions sometimes, uh, but not with Jesus. Uh, but he doesn't apologize to them at all. He just, he's angry and he's grieved. And so I would ask us this, when we see our culture going sideways, going wacky, going weird, many of us get angry, many of us get grieved, but maybe we should do both. Because anger motivates you to action and grief motivates compassion. And these are two things I want to feel. When I see the culture going wacky and sideways, I want to feel angry and, angry and grieved in, in the right sense, in the right way to have a right response, not unbalanced. Grief, I give up. I'm in despair. 
anger, I lash out. But put them together in a godly way, and perhaps I take right action to really help people and navigate these issues, um, whatever they be. And then finally, verse 6, the Pharisees respond, and they worship Jesus, and they bow down to their true Messiah and King. Oh, no, that was, no, that's not, that was the parallel universe version. Um, No, in verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. And this is where the plot begins, right? The actual plotting and planning. How can we work it out to bring him down, right? How can we work it out to bring him down? We'll see that come to its fruition at the crucifixion of Christ. I think here's our application, two major applications from this passage. And we'll go to your guys' questions um, and thoughts. One is know the word in the letter of what it says and in the heart of what it means. In the letter and the heart. And don't add to it. But know it in its, in its actual purity of the teaching of what God's word has. Know the, the letter and the heart because Jesus seems to be relying on both of those to make his points. And the second one is be bold as a Christian. If you were to preach the gospel and stand on cultural issues, and you're talking about whether it's, it's, it's the confusion in our culture about gender, the confusion and the harm in our culture being done with drugs and with sexual immorality and with just the obsession with self and pride and self-affirmation, all these kinds of things, you start coming against these things, and it resulted in someone plotting your death, you would probably feel like you blew it. Well, I don't know what I did, man, but they want to kill me now. I must have not represented Christ well. But can I just say, this ends with them plotting the death of Jesus. And it was a success. It was the Father's will, and he's walking the path that has been laid for him. I think that for us, we have to be bold about the truth of Christ. Not because we're just angry, but because we're also grieved. But we also uh, need to be okay with the reaction of our culture and not think that if I just say it the right way, they'll accept me and at least they'll like me. And um, that man-pleasing motive will mess up your witness. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word, your holy word and Jesus for the nuanced and careful and sometimes even difficult way in which you, you challenge us to set aside our traditions yet to hold fast to the scripture and to understand the heart of God being communicated there as well as the, the letter details that we get. We just pray we would have the fullness of all that in our understanding and we also ask, Lord, for boldness. For boldness to share the truth of Christ in a way that is meant to uh, wake up a culture that is so in need, to have their consciences alerted to their need for Jesus and if they get triggered, uh, let us just be those who represent you well when it happens. Let it be according to your plan, according to your will, Lord. We ask that we would be bold and confident representatives, ambassadors for Christ, that we could be compassionate and persuasive, but that we would not compromise truth in an attempt to persuade. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.